Welcome everybody. So a couple of warnings. So, ooh, it's kind of dark, isn't it? I think it'll be okay. Is it showing up okay on the screen? This is not a great angle, so it's all on you and your projection skills. Okay. All right. Well, let's see if we can. You want me to uh, dim? We might dim it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. If we're. Uh, we can. Oh, not that much. Oh, no, it's fine. That's okay. That'll be okay, right? Okay, so first of all, it's nice to see some of you. Some of you, yeah, it's nice to see all of you. I'll say this. <laughs> um, so, uh, I apologize. I wasn't able to put as much time into setting this up as I was hoping, just because I've been kind of slammed the past couple weeks. Uh, but the, the first part of this Maybe the first 30 to 40, 40 minutes is just going to be kind of a lecture on some of the background, some background information on Laura. And then, and I kind of have it set up to where the audience doesn't have to be, like, you don't have to have taken, like, a, a radio class or anything. We're going we're gonna to go through some details, which even with the pandemic, even if you did take a radio class, who knows how much, right? You know, everybody needs a refresher. So, so we're going to go through it. It pretty much should be pretty much uh, accessible to almost any audience as we go through this. But... I'm going to start by talking about what LoRa is, um, and then talk about a couple terms, and then get into the details of, of what makes this uh, radio protocol unique, what makes it do what it does, what are the features of it that improve or, 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 or worsen various aspects of the communications protocol. Um, and then we're going to jump, then I'm going to talk briefly about LoRaWAN. LoRaWAN is a um, is is something you need to know more about if you wanted to use the Things Network or if you wanted to use any of a variety of these public networks that, that uh, you know, we can even probably prop that. It'll probably be fine. Just the chair or? Well, or the trash can. The trash can would be good. We're not supposed to, but we'll say it's a COVID thing. We're trying to get here full. We'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say no if we say it's for COVID. So, well, it's being recorded. Now I'm in trouble. <laughs> we'll just edit that part. <laughs> so, so um, yeah. So then, then I talk a little bit about Things Network, and then we're going to jump right into basically using this because a lot of times you get one of these presentations that goes over the theoretical stuff, and it doesn't really give you a good idea of how difficult is it to actually start using these. And so to as to make these accessible, the LoRa itself isn't actually like even if you had to from scratch write libraries to use these LoRa radios. They're not actually that tough, um, but I bought I bought five of these things. I didn't know how many people were going to be here, so you're going to have to split up into groups because I think I was going to use one for the ping pong, and the rest of you were going to have to. So you might have to split up into groups, but I didn't have time to actually make sure they all they're still in a package, so you're going to have to open these up. But I opened up two of them, and one of them has a surface mount resistor that was like missing, and it was meant to didn't communicate over USB, so they weren't. They weren't that totally well checked, so I apologize if one of these doesn't work. But we're going to break up into groups and actually do some basic stuff with these uh, after that. So we're going to so you're going to actually you're going to be able to write code or copy code that exists and then modify it, and we're going to step through what the code does to actually form a communication with these lower radios. So. So what is LoRa? So first of all, LoRa is, um, is entirely proprietary. So there's a company called Semtech, and Semtech sort of said, we've come up with a recipe that mixes all the special spices that can achieve this really particular, useful attribute for radios. And so we, Semtech, are going to make these radios. And then our goal is, how do we get people to buy as many of these radios as we can? So a lot of their goal for getting people to buy as many of these radios as they can is this company, Semtech, said we're not gonna we're not gonna make money with anything other than the radios. So they said everything else you're free to, to do with it as you please. So if you want to buy two radios and set up your own personal network and never pay a license fee or anything, you can do that. If you are a city and your your city wants to set up a thousand of these. Um, you don't have to pay any license fees or anything. All you got to do is pay Semtech for the radios. And the radios cost about 2 to $3. Um, 
the receiver, the, the base station radios are more like thirty to forty dollars, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, but that's one of the, actually the benefits of this is they didn't choose, a, they chose a model of making money that let people say, all right, I'm not going to have to keep paying somebody, which is, which, you know, which is kind of almost limiting in terms of people's scope of imagination, right? If you build a long-range network in your backyard, you don't want to have to keep paying $100 a year for it to work. So LoRa is a radio uh, communications uh, hardware and protocol that operates kind of in this, if we look at the axis of range, boy, if I had known it was going to be this way, I would have done white borders here. If you look on the axis, this bottom axis is range, so that's length that you can get a transmission to send. And this vertical axis is bandwidth, where high bandwidth at the top and low bandwidth at the bottom. Laura sits in this kind of, and, and this, this oval size, by the way, was chosen by Semtech, so I didn't pick the oval size here. I probably would have made it a little bit smaller. Um, but Laura sits in this, in this low bandwidth, potentially very long range area. But it should be noted that cellular can actually get almost as long range as LoRa. Um, the main, the, you know, the main reason, if you say, well, I need to send data uh, two miles with a radio, uh, a cell phone can do that. A cell phone can send data, you know, you can use your cell phone on the plane. They tell you not to, but if you're on a plane, you get great cell phone reception. And, you know, your plane is five miles off the surface of the earth. Clearly, your cell phone has pretty good range. The difference is, your cell phone, um, you have to recharge it once a day, and when it's transmitting, it's transmitting with about two watts of power. So your cell phone uh, uses a huge amount of energy to transmit long range. The other thing is, cell phone, cell phone communication is normally based on this concept of the receiver. The, the cell tower is a very expensive, very precise machine. So a cell tower that receives cell radio signals, your cell phone is, you know, they keep the radios pretty cheap. They're not perfectly timed. They're not perfectly tuned. Um, but the, the way you achieve good cellular communication is that it does assume that the cell tower is very well designed. So extremely high, extremely sensitive receiver. It's able to, to get a very low power signal. Usually, uh, some cell towers actually, in order to get really good receivers, they have cryogenically cooled Resonator. So they actually have circuits that are inside of a of a, a something that. Well, lately they use Peltiers, but they used to actually have a compressor that would compress liquid nitrogen inside every cell tower. They had this going on. They would have this liquid nitrogen to cool a circuit to get really good performance. But the that downside is somebody's got to pay thousands of dollars for that cell tower. And so if you were trying to achieve long range communication you probably wouldn't consider it reasonable to say, all right, I'll pay $2 for one device, and I'll pay $20,000 for the other device. You'd want probably both of them to be cheap. So, so LoRa, really where it's special is it can communicate in this long range area over here, and it can do so with inexpensive, inaccurate transmitters and receivers. And that's something that's not very easy to do with some of these other technologies, but I do want to warn people that Bluetooth Bluetooth, um, they also want to be able to play games out here. So the stuff that LoRa radios do is not particularly special in terms of hardware. It's more special in terms of how internal that hardware signals are processed. And that is an area that, that Bluetooth actually wants to, to make a market into. So it's very likely that you'll see in the upcoming years people being able to do very similar things that we can do with LoRa using the Bluetooth standard. The difference is Bluetooth wants to be everything for everybody. So the Bluetooth standard, you know, they want to be able to be high-speed data transmission at short range so you can stream high-quality audio, but they also want to be able to do things like have a, a tag, right? If you have like a, I don't know if I, usually with mine and the batteries, that, nope, the battery must have died and I threw it away. You have those little tile tags, right? So the tile tags are Bluetooth, and they want those to also, in the future, function from you know a mile away or two miles away. And so, so they're trying to make a market in here. So don't think Laura is the only one, and will be the only one forever. But for now, they're probably the best way to get this really long range communication. Okay, what? Oh. <laughs> so it's good for cheaply sending data long distances. It's not ideal for high throughput. That's the thing. A lot of people, when I talk about 
when I, when I describe LoRa technology to them and I say, oh, for $3, you can get a radio that can send data five miles away. And a lot of times, if, if they haven't have really been properly introduced to LoRa, they say, oh, that could be so cool. You could, you know, send a video of a, it's like, well, hold on, I don't send video. Oh, well, you could, you know, you could make a walkie-talkie. Well, you know, you're not gonna make a walkie-talkie, right? You're, this is very limited in terms of its ability to send data long range. Sometimes you'll see things say, oh, LoRa is capable of transmitting up to 250 kilobits per second. You might say, 250 kilobits? Yeah, you can do audio with that pretty easily. You might even be able to do pretty terrible video. Uh, but when they're talking 250 kilobits per second, that's, if you operate LoRa that way, you are not going to get the miles of range that people talk about sometimes. If you want to operate LoRa to the point where you get like a mile of range or more, you're going to be sending data very slowly. You're going to be sending bytes of data per minute, not megabytes of data per minute, not even kilobytes of data per minute. So, so it's really important to keep that in mind. That you know, it's it's good to have you know flights of imagination, but keep it grounded in the sense of there's a price to everything, right? You're not going to get long-range high data throughput for three dollars and not have it consume a huge amount of power. So, uh, okay, so yeah, good for low power and long range. If you're okay sacrificing data, and that's the why do I keep walking on the keyboard? That's the biggest thing that people, you know, the types of applications that people want to use this stuff for is stuff like I'm a farmer and I have a whole bunch of land and I got these cows, and I don't want to pay a cell company $20 a month to have cellular collars on the cows. So I'm just gonna put this radio on the cow and I don't, I just, every once in a while, I just need to know where the cow is. I don't need to know every millisecond where the cow is. I just need to know from day to day, where did the cow wander off to so I can find it. Or this is stuff like, you know, I've got a, you know, a, a piece of equipment. I'm a company. We've got a big, giant yard that holds all of our stuff, right? Let's say we sell, like, like, a, like a pipe fitting, right? We've got a giant butterfly valve, and it's on a pallet somewhere in the corner of our yard. We don't know where it is. Well, if we can pay three bucks to put a little tag on a pallet, and we can find out where that tag is located every day or so, maybe even every month, that's going to be fine for us. So, thing, you know, a lot of the initial applications for Laura, they, Laura, the Laura as a company was thinking inventory track. They also, Laura Semtech as a company, also promised you would be able to triangulate the position of objects using time delay. Right. So basically, that when it sends a radio signal, oh, that's a, that's a radio transmission. If you do have devices that have GPS, they can have very precise clocks, they can have very accurate clocks, they can determine based on the time it takes for the signal arrive, they can triangulate the position. That doesn't actually work with LoRa. So what they promised people would work for that, it doesn't actually work. Uh, because time of flight, the problem with LoRa is it sends data so slowly, you get all this multi-path signal interference, um, you never get a precise time that the signal actually arrived at your device, you never get precise. Um, it's much, the only way to really get positioning with LoRa is to use signal strength indicator. Semtech has said they're, they're coming out with a newer version that actually should be able to do what they initially promised, but the big thing they promised, which was that, which was going to make them a trillion dollar company, did not pan out. And so they are a billion dollar company. <laughs> <laughs> um, if they can do that, if you can determine within a foot where something is two miles away, uh, that, I'm gonna stop me. Say, don't, 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 don't walk back over there. You got your own keyboard. Okay, so so it is it's proprietary, and that's one of the biggest things. So so it is a secret sauce. All the guts of Laura. If there's a patent, but the patent is like you know they, the patent is like we mixed flour and pepper, and steak. And there, so we got a you know a, a fried steak or whatever, right? So they, they don't actually go into much details. Um, and the, the, it's good, it's an optimized blend, and they, they actually did as a company do a good job of this, of choosing the right blend of spread spectrum repetition error correction to get reliable long range communication with low power. Um, and you have a potentially very high link fudge, and we'll talk about that later. So basically that's the, um, you know, a, as a radio signal travels through planet Earth on the surface of the Earth, it's losing its energy. It's not only losing its energy just in terms of concentric circles from a transmitter, and as the surface area gets bigger, the energy gets, you know, you get a smaller piece of each thing. But also, as this radio wave is propagating through moisture in the air, as it's, as it's picking up interference, as it's bouncing off things, as it's, you know, other, other signals are, are interfering with it, it's coupling with metal things along the way, 
all that stuff causes the strength of a radio signal to degrade, and link budget kind of refers to how much can you allow it to degrade and still recover that information at the end. So it's potentially very high for that. And it's designed to work, this is the big thing, it's designed to work where both the transmitter and the receiver have bad timing. It's, the specification for uh, LoRa is 30 parts per million error. So 30 parts per million error um, is the type of timing that you can get for a 10 cent crystal oscillator. So a very cheap crystal oscillator can get you that sort of precision. If you want, uh, 30 parts per million is not good enough for a wristwatch. If you want a wristwatch that keeps time that doesn't lose 10 minutes a year, it's typically going to have to be 10 parts per million or less. So that's how bad the timing is. You might say, oh, 30 parts per million, that's, you know, count to a million, you're off by 30, that's not too bad. It's actually, that's not good as far as timing is concerned. But it makes it cheap on both ends because they do it like that. Okay, so the special sauce, the secret sauce, is actually not that secret. Laura's been completely reverse engineered. So if you want to look up the Laura spec, you can uh, look this uh, paper up. This is like a PhD thesis or, or uh, I'm not, I can't quite remember, but... Um, but this guy went to the effort of uh, just completely reverse engin engineering the LoRa specification. So you can, if you want to see the details, you can see it there. But just to warn you, it's not, uh, it's not easy to consume for a general audience. If you're very familiar with radio modulation techniques, um, details like that, then it'll, you'll be able to get into the weeds of it. If not, it's probably not going to mean much to you. So. Okay, so LoRa versus LoRa went. A lot of times when people talk about LoRa, they're talking about, oh, you can have your, your, your ironing board can be tagged and, and you'll be able to go online and you'll be able to see you know, where your ironing board is if it gets stolen or something like that. And normally when people are talking about that, what they're actually talking about is LoRaWAN. So LoRaWAN is a, um, it's a proprietary, or not, or, sorry, it's not really proprietary, but it's basically a, um, it is a network protocol specified that sits on top of the actual LoRa radio modulation standard. So if you buy a LoRa radio, that, that sets up the modulation. You can use this ability to transmit bytes of information any way you want. And the LoRa WAN standard is what establishes this sort of established method for public networks for, for if you want to make a device that can interact with a network that you didn't build, the best way to do it is to follow a standard, and that's what LoRaWAN is. It defines the sort of, how do you say hello, what are the ways you can communicate, what frequency options are you allowed to use, things like that. Um, the LoRaWAN standard is massive. It's like, uh, um, it, it is open, it's a, it's a, it's a not-for-profit not um, consortium that, that maintains this standard. So again, Semtech is not trying to make money off of this, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more of it later, but it's different than the actual LoRa radio. The LoRa radios don't necessarily have anything to do with, with what you put uh, software-wise on top of them. So we're going to begin talking about LoRa modulation. So LoRa radio is used what's called chirp spread spectrum. So this is where they, the signal they transmit varies in frequency, and the frequency sweeps in a chirp. And so um, there's sort of two types of chirp. You get the up chirp, you get the down chirp. There's not really much to say about that, but, um, but this is a frequency change. So this is a low frequency shifting to high frequency over time, or a high frequency shifting to a low frequency over time. And if you look at this on, if you, if you look at like, uh, just um, take, a, take a signal, a voltage signal as a function of time, apply some FFT on it or something, and look at frequency versus time, it looks something like this. And cleaned up a little bit, this is, this is a potentially an entire LoRa transmission. There is a preamble, and the preamble is used to, you know, when you have a radio that has a variable gain amplifier, it's always picking up noise. The radio receiver needs to know when it's no longer noise. It needs to have something that tells it, oh yeah, you're getting something that's not noise. So the LoRa receiver is always looking for this preamble. And as soon as it sees the preamble, it says it's showtime, it's time to pay attention. And then synchronization, there's a down chirp. So you get up chirp. Up chirp, down chirp tells you when you actually have the start of something that matters. And then there's a header payload and, and a CRC, and, and most of it doesn't matter. But it's basically, this is actually what it looks like in terms of frequency versus time for actually sending data over a LoRa uh, radio. Uh, and so why, why, do, why do we use this? Why do they use chirp spread spectrum. Why don't they just use something like uh, 
like uh, amplitude modulation or just uh, just a sort of on-off transmission at a certain frequency. The main reason that they like this these chirps is it's very easy for a receiver to identify this feature. So this this sort of chirping frequency um, is something that on the receiving end, even if you don't know exactly what frequency you're looking at, as long as you're looking at a wide enough range of frequencies, you're going to see this show up fairly easily. Why does it matter the whole, even if, as long as you're looking at a wide enough set of frequencies, you're going to see this feature appear? It's because, as I mentioned earlier, these do not have good timing. So they don't know exactly what frequency this thing is at. They just, because they're not accurate enough to know exactly what frequency they're operating at. But they are good enough to be able to observe a range of frequencies and see a feature like this. And then the internal guts of the radio, when they see a feature, they lock onto that frequency and then they sort of can easily see the up and downs and things like that. Okay. Any questions so far? I don't want to go too far for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were learning about preambles in 360 and everything. And um, there's like the peakiness of the preamble. And this one looks like much more regular and repetitive oh. than, so can you explain that? Yeah, so yeah. So normally, you normally wouldn't ever want to use a preamble that looks like this, because um, it would be very easy to have random noise that looks like an exact periodic thing. So with the lower radios, you can choose your preamble code. I think what happened here is the person who collected this on a scope, just to keep it clean, they used a preamble of like zero, 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 or something like that. So, but yeah, so th normally this would be a certain um, sequence of bits that you would almost never want them to be repetitive and, and consecutive, nor would you want it to be like only one of these bits is flipped. If you did, you'd be very likely to have a lot of times where the radio thinks there's a transmission starting and then it goes on. Also, you almost always want the last few bits to be different from each other because it's really important that it knows sort of when when it's actually ready to start getting data. So, uh, but but yeah. So the the biggest thing with a preamble is it can pretty much be anything. You don't want it to be something that's likely to show up as noise more often than other types of noise. So you wouldn't want a preamble set of data to be like all zeros or all ones or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll start in the back. So I just wanted to clarify. You you said that one of the things that they were looking at doing here is being able to let you triangulate where the location is. Yeah. So the butterfly valve or the cow. Yeah. We don't really know where the butterfly valve or the cow is, other than it is, it's somewhere. Is that correct? Because you said that they, or, or are they able to kind of get some kind of general area of the cows are a lot of them, here or? Well, a lot of them just the whatever tag they use, they add a GPS to. It. Oh. So the, so a lot of times the tag, you know, GPS is five dollars, lower tags three dollars. They'll say, well, whatever, twenty bucks including circuits and battery. That's good enough. And, but initially, initially the whole idea was you wouldn't even need to have the Lord GPS. Have so yeah, so, it could so the tab just sends the GPS thing and more handles the transmission. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'll get to you after. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a question about like the timing. Is there specific timing of each bit of information? Because it looks like some get cut off a little bit. It's like right. The kind of half transitions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's. Yeah, <laughs> that's deliberate. They deliberately do that as part of the encoding. The details of why they kind of have those disjointed transmissions is in the the um, the, the, demodul the demodulation standard. Oh. To be honest, I don't know. They do something like a Manchester encoding type thing where they sort of XOR the signal with something and then you can un-XOR it. I don't know. But anyway, but... Yeah. Um, it's like an encoding and decoding. Yeah, so it's not it's not just as simple as like ups or ones and downs or zeros. It's right. a, it's a much more complicated. But and largely it's there for there's a lot of error correcting that it does internally too. Do you have any questions? Uh, kind of build, building off of the previous questions, I was just curious as to why uh, triangulation doesn't work well with LoRa. And I, I heard you say a uh, term that I wasn't familiar with. You said the time of travel can vary. Is by that yeah. do you mean that it can be? very hard to tell the exact path that the signal actually took. Um, so it can, so the, so the idea with like triangulation with radio waves is you're relying on the speed of light to tell you the, the delay, right? The, the assumption is if you, if I'm a tag and there's two towers at two different locations and each tower knows how long it took for a radio wave to reach me, 
And then they can use that knowledge of how long it took for a radio wave to reach me or how long my radio wave took to reach them. They can use that knowledge to tell how far away I am from each tower and then triangulate my position. And so it should take, unless you make some serious assumptions, it would take three. Three different distances to triangulate the point of a, the point of a position. The problem is, normally that's okay with radio because radio, when you have sort of a very clear you know, wave function, you can see the exact... You can see a timing phase shift in the peak of the wave and the trough of the wave, and you can get a very precise, you can see when did that wave first appear, or where is the peak of that wave. And so you can, using that knowledge of the radio signal, you can sort of, you can easily sort of back, you know, you can get that distance. The problem with LoRa, and well, one of the reasons it's good is each, each bit of information, this is a fairly long period of time here. So this is, you know, the, the time, the time here between each one of these, you know, bits basically is in this amount of time. This is not like a gigahertz frequency. This is more like a hundred kilohertz frequency. And so the distance that light travels here is massive. And if you're operating these radios at a distance, this is not going to look this clean. If you're operating this radio at a distance, this is going to be this whole thing is going to be buried in noise. And so when this whole thing is buried in noise, the question is. Well, when did this bit start? You don't, you can't really tell. And what's happening is the same bit, the same bit was received, you know, the same signal as this frequency is shifting, that radio wave that was producing the frequency was kind of bouncing off the back wall, it was bouncing off the mountain over there. It was, you know, you, it was, you, it was getting this multi-path thing, which normally can mess up some radio, some, some radio uh, communication protocols don't like that multi-path thing. Laura doesn't mind it in large part because these chirps take so long that you know it's okay if a signal you know went a, a, a meter a mile away and then came back. It's not going to like you're not going to have a stronger signal arrive at the time of the next bit. And so, so it's that the only way that you actually get good triangulation is if you can determine exactly when a direct signal arrived, was transmitted, and arrived, and you can't tell, one, you can't guarantee it was direct, the signal you pick up, and you can't really tell when it arrived with Laura. So, so you, can, you can get a distance estimate based on the timing, but it's going to be accurate to within like a kilometer. And then, you know, you know, it's, you know it's based on the speed of right? light travels at, you know, uh, you know about, it takes in, in, in about a, right, so in about like a nanosecond, how far does light go? Second, it goes 300 million kilometers. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's fine. Yeah. So yeah. So three. Right. Three times ten to the eighth. Right. So. Yeah. So in, um, in a, a nanosecond, it goes about you know like that far or so. Yeah. And so that's good if you're if you're operating in a gigahertz band and you can tell exactly you know exactly what which waveform arrived when, you can get your positioning to within about yay difference. But yeah, if you're talking something like this, which is, you know, one hundred thousandth of a second, well then one hundred thousand, you know, one hundred thousandth of the time it takes light to travel in a second is a pretty long distance, right? So, so the, yeah, using light, the time it takes light to arrive only works when you really know when it arrives. Uh, and there's, there's other things that do that, like GPS satellites do that, but what they do is they take the exact same thing and they, they average over a very long period of time, so they're actually able to tell where that phase peak and trough is to get a phase shift. So. Oh my gosh, I just up now, now I do have to walk back. So. Okay. okay, so. LoRa allows you to have a lot of control over this actual signal that's being transmitted. And how you choose to control the signal that's being transmitted has a big impact on the sensitivity of the receiver. And, and really, always think about this as, imagine you were looking at the signal that's arriving buried in a bunch of noise. How easy would it be for you to perceive the existence or non-existence of a signal? So, and going back to, the, to what we had as the slide before, Imagine this started to get really, really, really noisy, right? Think about what features in this would make it easier to see where this is located. Like, you know, if these were bigger, if they were spread out, 
Yeah, if they're bigger or spread out, typically if it's buried in noise, it's going to be a little easier to pick out the feature just with your eye. And if you think about how you can pick it out with your eye, you can think about how the, the, the receiving radio can deal with it as well. So one of the things um, that you can control with the lower radios is what's called spreading factor. So the spreading factor basically just talks, is just referring to how long in the time domain are these chirps. So how long are these chirps in the time domain? And this, in this case, uh, in this case, the, the, the range of frequencies is, the, so the, the distance between the low frequency and the high frequency is kept the same as the spreading factor changes. And you can see it takes, you know, if you go for a, a bigger spreading factor, obviously, if you see, if you had a bunch of noise added to this image, it would be a lot harder to see what's going on here than it would be to see what's going on here. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to tell, even without noise in this image, it's a lot easier to tell this is an up chirp than to tell that if this, imagine this, you know, again, was blurry, it would be much more difficult to tell that was an up chirp. Um, now this is um, a spreading factor with a, where you have a, oops, a different bandwidth for each one. So in this case, the bandwidth is uh, 500 kilohertz, 250 kilohertz, 125 kilohertz. So in this case, you have, oh, sorry, this is, yeah, spreading factor 11, 9, and 7 for different bandwidths. Now, keep in mind, the angle of this is about the same. So the feature looks the same as you increase spreading factor and increase bandwidth. So as you increase spreading factor, I mean, it will take longer to send information. Yes, exactly. So you increase spreading factor, it's easier to decode the signal, even if it's really noisy, it's, but you can't send as much information. That's the story of LoRa, is everything you do to increase your ability to receive the signals take, makes it take longer to send the information. Okay, so looking at spreading factor, as we go from a spreading factor of 6 to 12, these are all different spreading factors that are available to you if you have one of these radios. So the, uh, the demodulator signal to noise ratio drops as, you, um, as, you, as the spreading factor increases. The downside is the number of chips it takes uh, to transmit each symbol. So chips are just a unit of measure, sort of the minimum unit of time of these radios that these radios rely on. So, um, yeah. So, and we, we'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about radio too. I said it was going to be accessible to a large group of people, but you'll notice if it takes twice as long to send the data, you're getting about you know a 2.5 decibel change in the sensitivity of that receiver. Okay, so hold up, right? Let's talk about signals. So, so the idea when you're if you want to be able to transmit a signal a long distance, there's there's sort of two things that you care about. One of them is how powerful is the signal when it's transmitted? So how much, you know, how powerful the signal is transmitted and how sensitive is the receiver? So how, how low power of a signal can show up at the receiver and the receiver still be able to determine what that information being transmitted was? And the distance, the, the change in energy between that, the change in energy between the signal when it's uh, transmitted and when it's received, it undergoes a certain amount of path loss. But uh, normally, um, the, the power difference between the transmitted power and the received power is called the budget. And the idea is basically your path loss, the energy loss and the path loss has to be less than the budget that you have for the communication. And so the more budget you have, the more of a disparity or differential between the transmitter power and the receiver sensitivity you have, the more you have available to lose along the path. And in particular that means the more, the more, you have to, the more energy you have to lose along the path, the longer physically, geographically, the path can be to have and you can still receive the signal. Okay, so a little bit about uh, about dBm when when you see units of dBm. So let's consider you have a transmitter with a transmit power of 23 dBm. So the dBm is is decibel uh, milli. So it's basically a decibel scale referenced around one milliwatt. And so the way you get back to power from a dBm rating is you take one milliwatt and you multiply it by 10 to the 20, in this case, 10 to the 23 divided by 10 times one milliwatt would give you the power that's equivalent to 23 dBm. So you can do this with your calculator, but this should be around 200 milliwatts. 
And this is actually, the 23 dBm was chosen because that's the maximum, the internal uh, amplifier on the chips that are sold by Semtech, the maximum, uh, the internal amplifier maximum output power is 23 dBm. Um, so let's consider a case where we have a receiver which can successfully receive a signal with 100 picowatts of power. So what is the link budget? So this could be interactive. I don't really want to make it. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. But you can, if you said, okay, let's say you could receive a signal that was 100 picowatts at the receiver side. You could put 100 picowatts here and solve backwards for X and I don't know what that is. It's something like, oh, that's uh, 10, that's uh, negative 120, I believe. So, so uh, a receiver sensitivity of negative 120 dBm would mean that the receiver can receive a signal with a power of 100 picowatts. And so the budget then, and people use link budget differently, but the way it's normally used in talking about LoRa is this differential. So 23 minus uh, negative 120 dBm, you'd have 143 dBm of budget, which would mean uh, that that's how much, that's the, you know, that's many orders of magnitude of energy that could be lost along the way. Okay, and the receiver sensitivity, most importantly, the receiver sensitivity is impacted by spreading factor bandwidth and error correction options. Okay, so coding rate, back to, going back to Laura really quick. Uh, Laura also has a feature called coding rate, and this is Laura packs uh, information along with the data that it's sending that help you uh, ensure that the data you got was correct. And one of the things it does is coding rate. And this basically says, how many bits of information are we going to send for every bit of real information? And so if we had a coding rate of 4 or 5, that would mean that we send 4 bits of information using 5 bits. Meaning that the fifth bit is used by the receiving radio to clean up anything that might have gone wrong. So if a bit had gotten flipped or something like that, this is saying, that 20% of the bits that we send are only to be used by the receiver to clean up our mess. And a coding rate of four to eight is saying half the bits we send are being used just to clean up the mess. So if the signal, if the signal is received, but there is, you know, there was a, some, something weird happened along the way and it flipped a bit from a one to a zero, it's basically, we're, we packed a whole bunch of extra information that allows the receiver to clean up. And there's a whole, I mean, this is, you could do a whole dissertation on different techniques and optimizations for making this happen, but basically suffice it to say, this is extra data that cleans up errors of data. But again, if we go four to eight instead of four to five, that's going to really help us be able to receive a valid packet. It's going to help improve the reliability of our link for communication. It's going to help us extend the distance over which we have what's considered a reliable link. The downside is it's going to take longer to transmit that data, which means our data can be transmitted slower. All right, let's do a coding example. I want to do just a really simple. So this is a, without getting too technical, this is just sort of a top level view of how we can encode information doing this sort of stuff. So let's consider this. This is, I want to send the number 1539. And I'm going to send it by repeating it four times. It's pretty clear to all of us in this room that the number I'm sending is 1539, right? But this is why, so I could tell you, I'm, I'm sending a number, you're receiving it, and I'm telling you, I plan to repeat the same number four times in a row. Okay. So, what about now? What number did I send you? Well, you, I sent 1539, 1529, 1539, 1539. You would probably say, yeah, you're trying to send me 1539. But what happened is there was a bit that got flipped. So just from a very top level view, you can see how... Sending extra information can be used by you, the receiver, to figure out what went wrong. So now, I'm still trying to send you 1539, but this is what you got. You got 173, you got 1739 repeated four times. You would say, aha, you're trying to send 1739. But I wasn't. What happened is, I had noise show up that was synchronous with the data that I sent you. So normally noise in radio systems is periodic. And in this case, I had noise that flipped a bit, and it went, and it flipped the same bit. So I saw 1739 over and over again. All right, so, so we noticed this, and I was trying to communicate with you, and we had a miscommunication. So I'm going to change what I do. And I'm going to say, all right, I plan to send you 1539, but I hate this stupid periodic thing that's messing with me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the number. 
1539, then I'm going to shift it over 1. 1539, shift it over, 1539, shift it over again. And this is how I plan to send you. Both of us on each end know this is how I plan to send you the data. So then, same error. It flipped our second number to a 7. Now can we determine, though, what our original number was? Well, if we look, right, we can see, let's just look for the second digit. The second digit that we were trying to send, we had one row that told us it was a 7, and then 5, 5, 5. So we had three that said it was a 5, one that said it was a 7. It's probably a 5. And then we had th one, two, three that said the next one was a 3, and one that said it was a 7 is probably a 3. So this is another kind of, from a very sort of cartoony representation, this is another method that Laura uses to avoid errors in data. And then talking a little bit more about coding rate. Let's say I do something else, and I don't have an example to extrapolate this just to save time. But let's say I add an extra number at the end of each set of numbers. And I say if you take all four numbers and you add them together, the last digit of the sum of the numbers is going to be represented by this last block. So now I've added an extra number that can be used to determine which row had a problem with it or which row didn't. So it gives extra information. You can see, you should, in 1, 5, 3, 9, it should be, oh, I hope I did the math on this right, 6. Yeah, it's 18, so the last digit was an 8. So again, extra, extra number, it's not, it's not times 4, it's just... I added 20% extra data to help us recover, to help us identify if there might have been an error somewhere in this transmission. So. Okay, so how do all these interact? So I'm going to go back to the computer and I'm going to use this calculator. So, let's see here. Oh, no, oh, what did I do? Is there like simulation software that we can use to like simulate? Oh, sorry, I'm just talking. To yes. like simulate like a Laura like network kind of thing? Uh, I don't know of a good, to simulate the network, I'm not quite sure. Um, there's calculators you can use, which is basically what this is. Yeah. Um, I don't know about simulating though. But so basically, um, this table gives, it, you know, it kind of gives some information that we've already given. But it lets us sort of enter a parameter for a radio. And it lets us say, what sensitivity is our receiver going to have now um, based on these settings? So for instance, let's go down here. So if we had a spreading factor of 12, and, um, and let's say our bandwidth is, let's use, um, well, let's not use 12, let's use 11. So actually, the LoRaWAN standard doesn't allow in North America you to use a spreading factor of 12 ever. So I think 11 is the highest spreading factor you can use. Let's just use a spreading factor of 11. Uh, a bit rate of 125 LoRaWAN allows that. A noise figure, this, this relates to the sort of the noise inherent in the circuit on the receiving end. So we can calculate the sensitivity. So this is, so the sensitivity of this receive, receiving radio, sorry, would be, uh, negative 134.53. So again, right, that is 100 picowatts, I said, was negative 120 dBm. So negative 134 dBm, that's a pretty, uh, when I say it's pretty highly sensitive, it means it can receive a very low power signal, which is what this represents. So this is a, this would, for most radios, this would be considered a very good receiver sensitivity. So this is, so, um, but let's change it a little bit. What if we change, what if we plan to send our data a little bit slower? Um, what if we plan to send the data slower and we, so we instead choose to go with 7.8 kilohertz. 7.8 kilohertz. Now my sensitivity is down to negative 146. That's a huge difference. Right, so keep in mind, this is a logarithmic scale. So we go from 130, negative 130 something, negative 140 something. We're talking, you know, that's an order of magnitude of power. That's the difference between, you know, 100 meters and 200 meters. So that's a really big difference when it comes to, like, energy loss in the signal. And a lot of people like to get kind of crazy with these. 
if you really wanted to go for absolute maximum range, you would do something like this. Spreading factor 12 and with as low as possible. Uh, well, you don't have much control over that. That's negative 140, and that's close to negative 150 dBm. Uh, but well, another thing I want to show you is, maybe I had another one here. Data rate calculator. So well, let's do that same thing. Spreading factor 12. Uh, coding rate, let's go the highest possible. Let's go to four. And let's go to that low bandwidth. So we're gonna send the data slowly. Um, so, what's our data rate? 11.4 bits per second. That's not even bytes per second. So that would mean, if we were doing this, it would take, maybe it is bytes, I don't know, this website is, seems a little sketchy, but, um, but still, we're talking, right, we're talking in one second, I mean, you could almost hear those chirps at the end of the thing, right? No, but this is, right, so this is extreme, now this is pushing the limit, right? This is going absolutely to the maximum sensitivity, and what I've found from working with these radios is you usually don't ever want to operate in this range, because even though theoretically this works okay, when you're talking about transmitting a small amount of data over a second, right? so if you wanted to transmit four bytes of data, you're talking, you're spending three seconds to transmit that. And three seconds is too long to be able to maintain a radio. This is going to be somebody shuffles something in their pocket, right? There's going to be some event that would have caused you to drop a packet or something over three seconds. So unless you have a very well-controlled environment and really well-controlled senders and receivers, if anything is touching a person or moving around, there's no way you're actually going to get reliable data transmission at these extreme ends. You just can't spend this much time sending a packet and not expect something weird to happen that messes it up. And that's just any radio transmission, you're going to lose a certain number of packets. Um, if you require you to basically get almost all of it in one shot without something getting reset or getting out of sync, it's going to be a problem. The other thing is, I said these radios are meant to work with very bad timing. They try to compensate their timing. They still have to stabilize their timing. So even if it's inaccurate, it still has to be stable. And the problem with these radios is as they're doing this transmission reception, their power output is changing. And so the radio heats up, and that skews the timing, and that messes it all up. So a lot of times, over the time it takes to send and receive this, the temperature change is going to cause it to lose calibration. Otherwise, the radio recalibrates itself every single time it sends a packet. So there's a big reason you don't want to do that. Um, yeah. Okay. So, but that's the power of LoRa is that you can do these sorts of things. Most radio standards don't let you play games anywhere near this kind of extreme level of low data rate throughput. Okay. Let's go back to. Um, okay. So. Briefly about LoRaWAN, to save time, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about LoRaWAN, but to this, oh gosh, you can't see that at all. Um, okay, so I'm going to have to narrate it. So, so basically this is, um, LoRaWAN allows you to use gateways. And these gateways, uh, you know, again, they could be a privately owned gateway, they could be a publicly owned gateway, they could be a four, four, they could be a, if you want to use my gateway, you have to send a special key, and if you want that key, you have to pay me $10 a month. You can do that. You can set up your own network and configure it in a way that somebody's got to pay you to use it. Um, but you have these gateways that can receive, transmit and receive signals from any number of devices within this area. The goal of the gateways is to then move that data to the broader internet, to uh, a network server, and then to something else, right, to a, a kiosk, to um, something that's on an Amazon server, something else like that. So basically, um, LoRaWAN is a way of getting data from these cheap little devices that are miles away from anything, out of that miles away from anything, and onto the internet. And, um, yeah, so, why do I still have the airtime calculator? Oh, I guess I, I guess I kind of messed the slide up a little bit. Okay. So LoRaWAN sits on top of LoRa protocol. That one of the nice things about it is by default it implements AES encryption end to end. So that's one of the biggest challenges when people are trying to set up, you know, a, their own sort of bespoke wireless network. 
is encryption can be a pain to get set up. So it implements it by default. So it's encrypted end to end. So that's a really nice feature. Um, and it offers a limited set of channels though. So one, one thing that we haven't talked about is the actual devices. These lower radios, which can both transmit and receive, um, they are very, fairly inexpensive, two to three bucks a piece. But Semtech also sells these uh, uh, receiver modules that are meant for base stations. And function or hardware-wise, they're pretty much the same. The difference is these devices are capable of taking the incoming radio signal and rather than just having, rather than just being configured to look at one data rate and one, uh, one bandwidth and one, you know, all those parameters we just talked about, rather than being locked into one set of those parameters, this radio can be configured to do eight simultaneously. So it can, it can demodulate using eight different protocols that are configured. So you could have with one of these receivers, you could have one protocol set up for very long range, low speed communication, one set up for mid-range, mid-speed communication, one set up for uh, uh, short-range, high-speed communication. And that's what's really nice about using these for doing something like, uh, like a LoRaWAN network that anybody can access. You can let the devices themselves can choose uh, from a collection of protocols they want to use, and they can still use those protocols with the receivers. But there's only eight. That's the problem, is it's limited still to eight. So if you're using LoRaWAN, you have to uh, determining based on what region of the planet you're in, you have to choose a different, you know, different configuration. One important thing to note: Europe has laws on using uh, radio frequencies that are different than the U.S. So in Europe, they say if you're going to transmit even on the public bands, like uh, in Europe it's 865, in the U.S. it's 9 900 megahertz. Um, if you want to transmit even on the public band, they say you have to be limited. You can't. You can only talk for a certain amount of time, then you have to shut up, and that prevents you from doing some of those crazy, some of those crazy, you know, long transmission time options with LoRa. Those, those are illegal to do in Europe. In the U.S., you can do them; it's still considered rude. And in rural areas in the U.S., you can actually transmit up to one watt continuously on these open public ISM bands. So, so, and the radio LoRa is offered. Oh, I should have said this earlier. LoRa uh, radios are. Offered in 433, the 433 megahertz ISM band, which is like three, the equivalent is like 380 or something in, in Europe and Asia. Uh, 900 megahertz US, 865 Europe, um, and also 2.4 gigahertz. But 2.4 gigahertz is a little more limited. That's what Wi Fi and microwave, that's what everything is on. So even though LoRa offers devices that will transmit at the 2.4 gigahertz, it's basically totally different. So most people, when they're using LoRa, they're talking about either 433 or 900 megahertz for doing their uh, communication. Um, why one and the other? 433 is better for transmitting through things. If you need to have a signal transmit through a concrete bunker, 433 is your deal. Uh, which Who knows why you want to transmit through a concrete bunker, right? Maybe maybe you have dark fantasies about the end of the world. They're nuts. You want to get an old missile silo and hunker down. So the flip side is 433, though, the antennas that are used for these are quarter wave antennas, so ultimately the antenna is going to have to have some element that is as long as a quarter of the wavelength of a radio frequency at that, at that speed. And so at 433, a quarter wave antenna is like that longish. And at 900, it's like that longish. So the radios that I have are 900 and they're like that. I have other radios that I've used for projects that have a big giant wire sticking off of them. Those are 433. So. Um, okay. So a limited set of channels, bandwidth, but you still have options. It does not prescribe public, private, free, paid, et cetera. So anybody can set up these networks. Anybody can set the standards for their own network. There's not any requirement for that. Um, and the standards are set by a not-for-profit group. So again, that's the idea. Some tech said, we only want to make money off the chips. So we're going to have let a group get together and decide what's best for the standard for using this LoRaWAN standard. And anybody can build it. You could right now go online, pay 100 bucks, Get one of these uh, receiver modules, uh, receivers, or one of these base stations. You could hook it up to an Ethernet port that's got an internet connection, and boom, you've got yourself your own Internet of Things uh, receiving station that can, can contribute to this kind of stuff. So anybody, anybody can. Okay, so let's get down into the details. We're gonna get, we're gonna jump down into the data sheet for the radios, and then we're gonna very quickly pivot to looking at actual code on, on our actual separate computers. So, um, 
This is the data sheet Semtech device. This is the chip that is the chip that almost all LoRa radios use. Uh, the differences in the chip, there's sort of minor differences based on the, the different versions of the chip. Um, but I mean, they're, fundamentally, they're all pretty much the same. Um, the, this doesn't matter, we can, we're not gonna go through that. Right? So some parameters right, you can see from these chips, um, some details on uh, supply current in transmitter mode, 90 milliamps, so if you're doing maximum, so that's if, yeah, 90 milliamps. Um, supply current in, let's see, receive mode? Yeah, so receiving, it's consuming about 20 milliamps of current while it's receiving, you know, different settings here. Again, transmitting though, it's consuming a fair amount of current, 90 milliamps. And this is another thing, a lot of people use lower radios, they're focused on if I have a battery, if I have a device with a battery and I want it to last on that battery for 10 years, how many times can I send data before my battery's gone? And so that's an important thing. You can basically determine, based on the calculator we just used, of how long it's going to be on the air and how, much, how many bits of data it can send. You can imagine how many bits of data you can send using that setting for a battery. You could calculate total life of this battery is going to be 100 kilobits of data. If that's the case, you better think about how you want to use it. If you are like a gas company and you say, I want people's gas meter to tell me how much gas they've used, and I wanted to use this battery, and I don't want to have to, have to send somebody to people's houses, which they don't even knock. They just like go in your backyard. Like, people got dogs. I don't know how they don't get bit all the time. Anyway, we're going to send people into people's backyard, change the batteries only once every five years. Well, if you're a gas company, all you care about is you know once a month or so, right? You don't necessarily need to know every day what somebody's gas consumption is, just only when you're going to make them pay up, right? So, so you get the pay up sucker day of the month, that's when it sends a signal, and every other day is fine. And so five years, gas company, five years, once a month, you're talking 60 transmissions on a battery. So you maybe don't even care if you got 90 million amps. And you might not even care if it takes you a second to do that transmission in that particular application. All right, so within the data sheet for the module, there are these lovely flow charts. I love when, when manufacturers actually do this. This is normally the stuff you gotta pay somebody who's like a consultant who also works for the company to give you. But it gives you the process by which you can configure these radios. If you wanted to configure these radios by hand, it's fairly straightforward. Mode request standby, transmit initiate, write data to the FIFO buffer, uh, mode request to transmit, wait for interrupt response, uh, change the standby mode automatically, and then if you have a new transmission, repeat. All of these, each one of these steps refer to, if you were communicating with the module, you'd have to read or write data to registers of the module to do each one of these steps. For that, you'd have to dig a little bit further in the data sheet, but it's really not that tough. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna use libraries where somebody's already done this, but if you look into the guts of the library, when you do the code, you know, transmit packet, it's going through this step, and you can look in the code for the drivers, and you can see basically each one of these steps. You can see what register it writes to, what data it writes to that register. It'll all make sense if you look at the raw code and look at the data sheet. Same thing for receiving. So when you're receiving, they have a similar flow chart um, that you go through for reception. Reception is a little bit different because different things can happen when you receive a signal. Um, okay, so now let's just jump right into actual code. So for this, what we're, oh yeah, you can't see that. See, that's a problem. I use this like weird... Like, yeah, I don't know. So, <laughs> USC colors, right? So, um, so what we're going to do today is these radios are a clone of a radio that's used by Adafruit. So, if you go to um, just search for the Feather 32U4 LoRa online, and you'll find the page for this. And I'll pull it up over here. company that's making money on a whole lot more than the chip. So they're, so the one, the version that I bought for this thing, I got it from China for like 20 bucks instead of 32, that's the difference. But it's pretty much the same device, but the, um, but that is, the chip itself is just here. All the other stuff, you know, or sorry, the chip itself is here. That's a microcontroller. This is 
this is all the like capacitors and, and uh, resistors and stuff around the chip itself for the module. So the only thing Semtech sells for two or three dollars is that. This whole thing is going to cost you more like four dollars. And then you know the MCU and plus the markup, right? They have to like buy donuts for their company and you know, pay for kids' dental and stuff like that. So that's where the price is. But if you're doing it yourself, if you were making your own LoRa device from scratch, your raw cost for using LoRa would be about two to three bucks. So. so when you get here, what I'm going to need everybody to do is sort of follow the process that's listed here for installing these, the proper drivers on your computer. The most important thing to pay attention to is. If, if you find this page, if you're able to get to this page, um, this is not the starting part of this. Um, if you go back, oops. If you go back, I think we gotta go back one more. Oops. Yeah, so this using with the Arduino IDE, we should have the Arduino IDE already on the computers. But the most important thing you have to do is, uh, Oh, you gotta go back even one more. Sorry, everybody. So you have to do this um, in the Arduino software. You have to do this additional board manager URLs, and you have to put this there. So you gotta you gotta tell the Arduino where it needs to find the definitions for this particular board. So follow these. Um, Anybody who wants to get this set up and to get this code running and be able to load their custom code onto the devices, just follow the steps here. Um, and it's pretty quick. So it's basically, you're going to uh, add this URL to the, to the Arduino setup. Then you're going to... Then after you've done that, you go to the next one and you're going to go to the boards manager and you're going to go to contributed boards and type in Adafruit and then you're going to install this Adafruit AVR boards uh, But I mean, it's, what, what's up there is the same thing as on there. Well, I'm going to take a two-minute break to go get some water and uh, have anything to drink since like 9 a.m. I'm going to get some water and I might solder a battery really quick. I know, I know. I think they're going to come all over.
So, so Okay, how are people doing with the install? Oh yeah, don't skip over the blink example. You can get through, you can see, yeah, you don't gotta do the blink example. Did you get the radio head drivers? Yep. All right, now you might want to actually, so you've got the radio head drivers uh, moved over to, did you move it over to the library folder? The, I think so. That was the... Oh, did you just install it like that? Like this, yeah. Oh, the radio, the radio drivers? Go to the next one. Oh, yeah, go ahead and go to the one after. Let's see. So radio radio drivers, you got radio drivers? 
Yeah, so okay, so if you go to let me let me go to the to the page where the radiohead driver stuff is. Okay, so if you're if you're up to the using the using the RMF nine radio, um, you're gonna want to download this, and you're gonna want to unzip this to the folder you're gonna use is if you go to. File Explorer default series. What did Windows? Is this, Windows, is this Windows 11 nonsense? No, it's Windows 11. You can tell it's not the time you're using it. Yes. Yeah, the bar is back. I'm just going to do it in well, this is not the way to do it. Uh, so you okay, so you're going to want to go to, I believe it's document. No, 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 no. Hold on. Wait, wait for it. Documents, Arduino, libraries. Yeah, is that yeah. it? Yeah, that's where it is. Um, once you have that, you should be able to load the default code here. So you can go down on this page and go to um, go to the uh, go to the transmitter code example here and copy the code. Actually, I should probably be doing this on my own. Thank <laughs> you. 
So what this is doing here is, you know, th these devices that we have, they're a microcontroller and the radio. And so in terms of communicating with the, with the radio, all the Semtech radios communicate with the, with the SPI protocol, with SPI. Um, but they also, because they use SPI, they need to have a chip select. And they also have a reset pin and an interrupt pin. So the interrupt pin is used for when the radio needs to tell the microcontroller that it's connected to that something happened, it uses that interrupt pin. And normally, what you would do is you would set up an interrupt request on the microcontroller so that as soon as the radio has something that happens, like it receives a packet or it's done transmitting or whatever you set the interrupt to do, as soon as it does that, it runs some interrupt handler routine. I don't believe this code actually does that. I believe this code pulls. So this code, rather than 
necessarily waiting for the interrupt. It, it constantly sends data to, I think, I can't remember with these particular drivers, but I think it constantly checks with the chip and says, have you finished sending, have you finished sending, have you finished sending, and then once it does. I could be wrong about that, though. I got, it's been a while since I looked at it. Um, so if that's good, then if that compiled and that all works, then I just want to really quickly say what this does. So this code, this one, it does this initialization. So well, it creates a, a, an instance of, of the handler. Um, it does just some, some configuration of pins with a microcontroller. The first thing it does, it does a reset. So it manually resets the chip. This is always a good idea. When things turn on, when things are first plugged in, they turn on, and you have an MCU connected to a radio. Who knows what kind of weird sort of random bits it got as everything was getting turned, as everything was turning on. Especially in the case of devices that program themselves over the spy wires, which is what they do in this case, I believe. Yeah. Um, so devices that program using those pins, you can totally mess with the radio when they first turn on. It's best to reset it. You reset it. And then you do this initialization, and if you look at the code for the initialization, it's really, what it's doing is it is setting the registers based on the stuff we just talked about, the, the uh, 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 frequency, the uh, uh, coding, the uh, bandwidth, all these parameters, it's setting those in the registers of the radio. It's nice to go in and look at that stuff, um, and then it sees if it actually got, if it actually worked, if it actually communicated with the radio, it doesn't know whether or not there's a radio actually attached. Um, uh, then it sets the frequency, so the frequency is defined earlier, one of the, um, and then the default. So one thing to note for the default is, I don't think it defaults to that. I think it knows to do 915, did it? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's on. Or down lower. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah, here we go. Yeah, right here. Right. So it knows what frequency it needs to be set. So this some of this comment is not correct for this particular code. Um, but so just know that it defaults to. Um, I think it does default to 13 dBm bandwidth 125 kilohertz, uh, coding rate four or five. Uh, Spreading factor, 128 chips per second. That's a very low spreading factor, but I think that's spreading factor seven or so. So all these are not ideal for getting long-range communication. So the default parameters of this are not ideal, but they're easy to change, and we can we can hopefully change them. But the first thing it does is it says, no, 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 don't give me this default 13 dBm. I want to drink from the fire hose. It sets it to 23 dBm. That's 200 milliwatts output power. That's the maximum. Some people have found they actually get slightly shorter range going all that high just because there's some amplifier clipping on some of these when they get that high. Um, but uh, yeah, and then all they do is, using this particular driver, it's really straightforward to send packets of data. You generate a packet. Oops. You generate, just, this is just a character array. You generate a character array. In this case, it's got uh, a, a string. Um, and then you, um, you, you know, this this is the uh, the integer to character string function in C. Um, so you append this, you append the packet number, which is a variable that you're accumulating. You append that to this character string at character position 10. Uh, then it looks like you set the last bit to zero to say, if, you know, if it's a character string, it's supposed to end with a null terminator, which is the same as a zero. And then this is all it does, rf95.send. So it sends a link to the radio packet, the length of the transmission, and it just sends it. And so that is the, um, that is the, that's it. That's all it takes to send a packet. And just what it does then is it waits until the packet finishes sending. One thing to remember is it takes a long time for Laura to send data. So even if you have it set to a fast setting, it's going to take several milliseconds to send a packet. You don't want to switch the radio back into receiving mode. You don't want to do anything to the radio while it's transmitting. You don't even want to communicate with the radio while it's transmitting because the, the SPI data lines going high and low are going to create noise that's going to interfere with the signal as it's sending. So you really want to go radio silent while it's doing the, the transmission. Um, and then...
after you're done waiting for it to send, then you wait for a reply. So this code is set up to basically it sends out a packet, it waits for a something else to send data back, um, and then it prints it out. So this is, uh, um, you have, there's timeout settings, you can set a timeout of 1,000. So this is basically waiting up to a second, up to a second for this to receive a packet. And then if it receives a packet, say that you got it, send the data. Now this is really interesting. So this function here, rf95 last rssi, one of the nice things about LoRa is it records as it's receiving a signal, it's changing the gain on a lock, on an amplifier. And after it finishes receiving the packet, the last setting of that amplifier is saved in the radio. And that's a really nice feature because it lets you determine how, how amplified was, did the signal have to be that was being received to be able to be properly received by the radio, which tells you the strength of that signal. So, so this is a received signal strength indicator, I believe. But this number basically tells you the strength of the signal that you just received, which tells you as a proxy how far away that thing is. All right, so let's get, somebody's got to open these things up. Uh, we'll do one in the, uh, we'll, we'll, do, uh, we'll do two over there because you got a lot of people over there. So let's do one of these guys have to have. Oh, wait, wait, you gotta, you gotta have it. You guys should be working. Yeah, I'm already running the house. Yeah. Because we know the tutorials not too bad. Yeah. Well, that one's already got a It's pretty nice, I mean, that we're kind of going off the online part, and then we got that history, and now we're going to go back to it. It's all online. Can you four, you're going to have to probably just, once you get a change in code, you're going to have to swap radios and use it. But, um, so it's pretty straightforward. I'm going to do my, actually, I might change to the, I might switch to the other code on mine. Uh, no. He, uh, I'm doing good. I'm really excited about how many people. Uh, <laughs> can't speak for anyone else, but after a year of uh, doing all the online stuff, I want to get my hands on some hardware. Uh, before you plug in, oh, yeah. oh, oh so yeah, you gotta, you gotta oh. connect the antenna to it. It's a really, it's a really delicate little. Uh, radio connector there. It's a really delicate little so actually, I forgot about these stupid antennas. So let, let me let me plug these in because they're kind of. If I mess up the service, not saying it's okay. You know? Oh no! What the heck? I was looking for it. Ah, uh, yours isn't gonna work. <laughs> Fly by night thing. Only missing the SMA. No, we'll do it with a wire. Look up how long of a wire you need to have for for 915 megahertz communication. What about if you have how precise is the wire? Oh, okay. Is it a service mapping? Yeah, I don't know. We'll do it. We'll get yours. Will be a janky wire. We'll see the power difference for it. Okay, we got a ruler. <laughs> I've got a ruler for you. You got a ruler? Yeah, I got a small one. You probably have one at Red too. Yeah. There's like a ruler on this. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I think. Oh, you got a wire over here too. There's a spot where you're supposed to be. Nice. Oh, wait, we did have scissors. We had a wire over here. Wait, you know what?
Guarantee there's not a full USB connector. Oh, oh really? Uh, yeah, try it on the one on your guys as well. Yeah. Uh, Wait, what's happening? Oh, they have a, a upload error on there, so we're trying to have another one. Select calm. Yes. Hey, you guys have a port? Oh, it's on. Whoa, hold on. Yeah, it didn't load, it didn't load right. Hold on. Um, it didn't load right on that one. It's behind the other port. It's not a port. It's not a port. Someone's got this up and running. Cables here. Yeah. Uh, no, I, so, 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 so,
leftover junk like the blah, 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 blah. But whatever, it's a string. You can pull it and parse the data from it in 15 minutes. I think it's just telling us with the stuff we said What's it already. Right? A is a string. A is a string. I think it's not. Well, I don't know. The, no, the. Okay, it's a restring signal strength. What? So. Does somebody else have to get set over? That's uh, yeah. That's <laughs> oh no no no! Everybody's communicating yeah, the same message. Yeah, I, I think that we're all. Everybody unplug your device except for one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, and running the same program. 
Did yeah. you catch that That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I unplugged. I unplugged. You unplugged? Yeah. Does everybody unplug? We did not unplug. You're still plugged in? Yeah. That's right. What does it say? Is it showing the single strength coming back? So I think they'll like start out. Yeah. Negative 41. Yeah. Negative 41. Well, there's a bunch of jump here. No, just. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh yeah, there's six. Sorry, I just talked about that. Right, so you're saying, so you're saying, so I said your signal strength is negative 44. That's pretty, or negative 41, you saw it as, so it's pretty balanced. I'm curious, turn yours off and the people with the whip antenna. I'm curious here. <laughs> what if it's better, what if it's better? <laughs> So, so one thing about these modules is modules have a plug-in for a battery, so you can actually the little whip and the little whip connector, you can connect a battery to that, and and then it's then it's more mobile, you can move around. Then we have like a oh wait wait I know what I can do hold up. Which interior do you have? This part? No, no, no. This is the. So imagine this is the house. No, imagine this is the house. Yeah. Take it all back. I can't. Okay, wait, wait. Here's what I can do though. Oh, yeah. Let me get, right. let me get closer to you. Like hanging off the edge. I've seen that. It's single strength with the Are you the one Yeah. Yeah. It's not like physical, the same issue. Here's my two, and then when I move back here. Yeah, it's the weakest link. All right, so like in terms of like close proximity, you can very accurately determine distance from that. So why don't you turn you turn yours off, and we'll, we'll let that group go, and then that group goes to see what they get. It wouldn't be able to yeah. tell you direction. No, just single-strength data, right? But the thing is, if you were, let's say, let's say you bought two of these. I'm happy to leave these radios for people to play with, right? People can play with these all they want. Don't like keep them. Like we'll keep them. We'll make them IEEE radios. But the um, if you wanted to have multiple devices communicating, I totally forgot about this. Normally, what you do is you just make the first byte of the packet that you send a byte that corresponds to the device. So if you were device number seven. You would always send a, send a packet with the first byte being a seven, the rest of it can be whatever. And if you received a packet, you would basically, um, normally the sender would attach their uh, byte that indicates what their name is, and the next byte would be the one who they intend to receive it. So if you received a packet and the byte for the receiver wasn't your number, you just throw it away and keep on going. So that's normally the way it goes. And there's, um, there's other libraries you can use other than the, the uh, the radio head one that implement kind of basic protocols along this line. They sort of do a packet inside the inside the raw radio packet. They do an additional packet that has a receiver number, a transmitter number, uh, and then the, the, uh, usually a digit that indicates that how much payload is valid, and then and then usually an extra uh, byte at the end for some sort of redundancy check. Uh, but it's very easy to use these radios. Very easy to get really powerful data like RSSI. And the raw cost of these radios is only a couple bucks. When did you buy them again? I bought them off the internet. I think it was, <laughs> I think it was like Amazon or something. It was like the the name of it's on the back of the board though. So if you Amazon search for like uh, whatever, it's like. Uh, 
The anchor disinterior. Oh, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's screwed. Yeah, now, if you do this. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Two of them for 36 bucks. Yeah. That's not bad. It's a prime chip. It's a corrosion area. What you want is, so if you had one of these, this anchor inside the shell, you have a little bit of the This comes out. You have to be removable from the person in the gym. Yeah. Don't touch it. Yeah, because if they're going to be in there, and that extra flexibility is that it's going to be in there. Yeah. And that's little things will extend the lot of skin. It's not hard to tell. Yeah, it's not hard to It's just that's where it breaks. Yeah. That's just what happens. Yeah. yeah. So you gotta fix some of the sticker out of the thing and catch that. That's not what's this first thing off. So you can bring it to work. You can make it more impact. So like the most of the house is just not so much. Well, it's good to know. Good to be aware of. Yeah. If you think anything an end user can fit in with, they will fit in with. I think I would rather get one of the Adafruit ones than one of these. It's so fun. It's a little fidget spinner. Yeah. What are you doing? Oh, 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 it was the cleverest uh, wall we've ever seen. The simplest way to do mesh capability is very straightforward. Basically, you receive a packet, and it's not to you. Instead of ignoring it, you send it. That's the simplest way to do mesh capability. You receive a packet, it's not meant to you. The only problem is, if there's two devices next to each other, you have to send it. Usually, you have you also have to keep a table of each Can you get this uploaded? Yeah, we have a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. 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 So one of the most genius hacks of the actual environment, you always have a standard model called the regulator, and just physically you could be doing things so you can't fuck with things. Yeah. Like an industrial environment, it's not regular or electric, it's fun, right? So there's a source of it. But what if that can't be turned off? What if that can never be unplugged if that shuts down like the sensor? I like they're like this is James and I like this. Yeah. If it's down but it works. If it ain't done. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to do a fair bit of mechanical design on this part of what I can do right now. For sure. So full, oh, like a like appliance size one. So I mean, I think I'm gonna laser cut most of it, but I'm trying to design it to the IP standards. So at least it's hard, one of them. It's hard, it's hard to get to this. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah I, not a high standard, just like, hey, like, I paid attention to this. I thought about it, you know. It's hard to know what players are going to go with actually, like, using it as a real world versus, like, this is a product of influence, this is great, but let's try using it. Yeah. You're like, oh, you're electrical design is great. Yeah. This is going to fall apart if you touch it. Hopefully, I want to have it working and take a time lapse video, too, of plants growing up inside it. And, that would be cool. What about the, like, the dumb shit you can do? Like shopping is sitting on the board, right? Coat the backside of the USB. Like, put foam behind it. Yeah. Now it has compliance. That sort of stuff where like, yeah. Uh, oh, rubber, rubber gaskets. Go back say, uh, like, 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 so what's going to kill you in the device? Vibration. So if you can cut for vibration error, it's just rattling your solder joint. You need a hard solder joint on one of those things? That's what will vibrate itself apart. It's not actually contact it. It's not physically touching it. Now you've got a lot of conjectivity. Right. If you get vibration between that little, a little bit of flex on it, causes that hard solder joint to break. Now you have an intermittent connection, so sometimes it works. Yeah. That's kind of fun to go with. Intermittent fault is too dirty a sword in the English language. Yeah.
Because you can't prove it. It was intermittent. Sometimes it works. How do you prove that you got rid of an intermittent fault? Those are a pain in the software too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Is that you I guess I'm a Probably a more games are going on today and right now, but yeah, it's more homework for me. We had to reduce that failure on our SPs. So we went through the we realized that. So any time you have like a communication protocol to use this, the key, they just usually do a standard one device locally generates a hash somehow. Right? They, well, you know, they locally generate some, some number. Yeah. They pick a key also at random. They take that key and hash it with their hash. And then they send it to the other device, which also hashes it with their hash. They send it back. They take off their hash, send it back. So now the other one they're receiving in, all they have to do is take off their hash and they'll get that real handshake back. So that's usually the way they handshake. That's basically the way AES yeah. works too. You're never sending a real value over the air. Mm -hmm. but, they, but you do have to be good at randomly generating, right? Yes. That's the Which on an embedded right? system could be difficult. Yeah, ran, getting a good random one embedded is really tough. Yes. So. I mean, you guess you could use CPU generator or something, but... A lot of them now, a lot of them, so MCUs that have, so the lower modules have a built-in random thing. They usually do, um, they use like, Six six digits of noise in the voltage of, or six digits of noise in the current through a silicon junction. Okay. So it's yeah, randomized so it by mm -hmm. fabrication process, and once you get into that many digits, it's like. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, but that's usually the way they, they do that. But yeah. But, but the base, I mean, the basic, um, the basic handshaking to never expose a key is so true. For that, you could without any certificates. Or yes. A certificate authority, you could man in the middle of that. Right. Yeah. You could. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now the other thing I'm wondering uh, for AES, you have your initialization vector block. You have however many blocks of data. Must they give a really short message, so it's less than 120 bits. Yeah. But then you also have your um, padding block. So would you be limited to sending a minimum of 384 bits? I think the thing is, so the, the protocol for the LoRaWAN actually, yeah. you send the data that you send gets sent over send over multiple packets over multiple for a long okay. period of time. So basically you're constantly sending this you're, it's a long process with it to send it. And so it's not it's they it although it is it is AES, but it's not um, you gotta check if you look in the standard it's I know it's basically like when the device first communicates with the with the station, it sends a lot of data. And actually to the point where they limit the number of times you're allowed to have a device like reinitialize its communication with the, like if, for the open public networks. If they had every device and every time it turned on, redo everything, it would yeah. waste way too, way too much overhead. So they kind of, um, um, I know it's they, it's kind of like a modify. It still maintains the same security, but it's basically like the you the all of the handshaking happens like once a day. Kind of. Okay, and then yeah. it keeps it has to maintain it. But it also means it needs persistent memory, which is. Anyway, but I don't know that much about AES, so I don't know. The, okay. I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm not an AES expert. I'm not a lore expert either, but I'm just used to it with that, so. You're the expert in this room. Yeah, but people, okay, oh, sorry. So we were trying to send a yeah, so the lyric here, but it got the cut off three blocks. Yeah. Those little yeah. preset messages yeah. might not be. Yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. So this is saying basically so at the 13, so 13, 13 15 bytes after the start where you have it. I don't think it does. It does the header for every time. Yeah. So the 384. 
Well, no, because um, for AES, AES can only work on a on fixed block sizes, and for that, you need an additional padding block to tell it, okay, that last block, how much of that is real data, how much is that just filler to fill out the whole 120 bits. And then you also, um, for AES, you have an initialization vector, so if you encrypt the same thing twice, you get a different type for that. And that's another 128 bits. Mm -hmm. so could, and, right, you know, and if you have these fully encrypted packets, like the people have these, but no character. Yeah, but each packet is encrypted. Yeah, because I'm thinking about like how you how that if you want to set it to one of the really long range things where it's really slow. Yeah. Normally, but 128 bits is like not that much. Yeah, that was Lora, not Lora WAN. Oh, okay. The Lora WAN handles AES and yes. Turing and yes. Yes. So, so Lora doesn't have. do AES. Lora itself, the hardware does not have built in AES. Okay. And I so think that's always a good idea. Yeah. Oh, that's always a good idea. I know. Yeah. Always a good idea. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.